Oh God, our hearts resonate with that song where we cry out to ourselves, let us praise the Lord. We feel our weakness. We feel those things mixed in us which would compete for fealty, for loyalty to you. We feel the mixing of loves for lesser things, and we yearn to sing now like we will in your presence in glory. We long that our hearts would unite with all creation in shouting out your glorious name. Oh God, would you be pleased here as we gather this morning to hear of your grace? Would you be pleased to cause the strains that we just sung, the refrains to echo in our own hearts, to resonate with our own thoughts. May we ever praise you. Lord, we ask even now as we get to hear the testimonies of grace through those being baptized, that you would give courage and clarity to those who would profess your love for them and their submission to you. Thank you for saving sinners. Thank you for loving the unlovely. Drawing those who weren't looking for you to yourself in love. We thank you so much for being a God who takes the weary and heavy laden and gives us rest. We praise you for these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare for baptism this morning, I want to turn your attention to Colossians chapter 1. I invite you to open your Bibles there and look along. And we will see there a, a treatise here on the person of Christ. And then a reflection on ourselves, those of us who are in Christ. In Colossians 1.15, Paul, writing of Christ, says this, He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn or preeminent one over all creation. For in Him, in Christ, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things have been created through Him, and for him. And he, Christ, is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and enemies in mind and in evil deeds, but now he reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly grounded and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. We see the incomparable Christ here. The preeminent one over all creation because he is the creator, the sustainer. That from Christ and through Christ and to Christ are all things. And what has he done? He has sought to reconcile all things to himself. To bring about his great reconciliation, his great peace. Even over, the, over all those things listed as thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. That is, even his enemies, Jesus will have his peace. Christ is the agent in the Godhead who will bring about the making right of all things. What's interesting is that while his enemies will find Christ's shalom under his boot, those who were his enemies but believed in him 
will find reconciliation to him as friends. As those who are forgiven, who have been brought to him in love. Look again at verse 21. Although you were formerly alienated and enemies in mind and enemies in evil deeds. But now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This is why Christ came. To go to a cross, to die a horrific death there, and and not merely the physically torturous death at the hands of men, but the unthinkable death and destruction under the hand of his father as Christ became the sin bearer for all who would believe. It pleased the father to crush him so that he might justify the many. And that is exactly what happens at the cross. Jesus Christ, the innocent, gets punished and the guilty get declared to be righteous. The guilty go free. The perfect one took our penalty. This is a costly substitution, a costly reconciliation for God to make friends out of his enemies, for God to reconcile us who are at enmity with him in our thoughts and our deeds and turn us into those who love him from the heart and yield to him as Lord and live according to his ways. For him to do all of that required supernatural work and an infinite payment. Four friends are coming before us this morning to testify of that transformation. Of forgiveness of sin and newness of life. And they're coming not because they were smart enough to have figured something out. Not because they have cleaned themselves up and started doing right. No, it is because they have been forgiven. It is because they have been cleansed, they have been transformed, they have been made new creatures by the grace of God. Their sins have been paid for at the cross of Christ, and they have surrendered themselves to Christ because he's better. Better than life before and better than everything else. And we get to hear from them this morning, talk about what God has done for them. We'll invite them up one by one and they will share their testimonies of God's grace in their lives. And we'll begin with Patrick Denny. Patrick, come on up and tell us what Jesus has done for you. Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. Well... For those who do not know me, uh, my name is Patrick Denny, and I was born originally in the Valley. The first thing I'd like to say is that I never thought I would be at this stand or actually being involved in a church uh, five, ten years ago. Never saw myself ever being here. My testimony begins at an early age where I was raised Catholic. My father did not attend church whatsoever through my upbringing and barely spoke about the topic. But my mother, to the best of her abilities, tried to make me involved in our local Catholic church. At that time, I hated everything to do with Sundays. Masses were filled with speeches of, you should do this and you should do that. And sermons were filled with meaningless concepts connecting everyday current events. But to the untrained ear, everything felt flat. God was not there in that church. As you can tell from this type of upbringing, I never heard the word of God, nor was I able to hear his words in scripture. The Bible to me was just a book, small words with a lot of pages. All the previous events that I just explained sent me down a path through high school and college of being rather lost and not understanding the truth, which did not allow me to have a moral backbone. So I pretty much fell for everything under the sun. 
after college, I left for a rather ungodly industry and location of Miami Beach, Florida, with zero community of like-minded believers around me. Even though I'm not proud of what I did during that time, I feel like it's worthwhile to share to you all as a warning or as a lesson to your own lives. In Miami, I did everything under the sun, drinking to excess, putting work and the accumulation of money and women as a priority, kind of like King Solomon to a degree. I don't believe I saw my family more than five months at a time, even though my Aunt Sharon always kept a watchful eye on me, asking me every month where I am at with God and Jesus. I look back now at her check-ins and thank God for them. During this time in Miami, I felt like I was somebody elite in society and thought as if I was moving in the right direction in life and becoming successful. Well, after five years of running the gambit, all of these pleasures and luxuries of life seem to no longer fulfill me, but rather actually tear a deeper hole inside my soul. This type of inner realizations of all the things that I had done led me into a deep depression to the point where I would wake up in the morning and not really sure, not really understand why I needed to get out of bed and I would justify the point of life. Even though I had tallied all of the good things in life and realized how much life and love I still had to live for, I didn't care. In the very beginning of 2021, I reached out to my mother explaining these troubles. Both of us agreed that no matter how much money I was making or prestige I was gathering, it would, it would be best if I came home to Arizona to rectify what was going on with my mental health. After this conversation with my mother, it was immediately clear to me to move back to Arizona without question. And this frankly gave me an accurate weighing of the job titles, money, girls, relationships that I had thought meant so much to me. Looking back now in the present, I value them probably 10 cents on the dollar, if that at all. So I moved back home to my parents' house at the age of 27. Not exactly where I thought I was going to be at at this stage of life. After three or four weeks of actually probably more than three or four weeks of constant vegetation on the couch, pondering what I should do with my, li my life next, I saw my primary care doctor and we discussed my mental health. The prescription was basic antidepressants. I wasn't a fan of these drugs from the beginning because I was brought up in a household and grew up around men that didn't believe in that kind of stuff. But at this point, I was willing to try anything to get, my, get myself out of the hole that I was in. Pushing forward two or three months later, I had become more content and leveled out to the point where I was able to start my own company regarding the skills that I had accumulated during my employments at other in companies in Miami. I had a small amount of success in that, in, the, in that business and created a little income that allowed me to plan a scuba diving trip with my best friends, the Kovacs, to the Dominican Republic. Not realizing that anti-depression medicine can cause nausea at spontaneous moments, that, but I had never struggled with it before. I found myself on a, on a dive around 115 feet and suddenly had the urge to throw up. It was a very lovely experience. I got done with that dive, got up and finished the day. And this is where it all began. Later that afternoon, I had a conversation with Elena Kovac about why I threw up underwater. And I explained to her the journey that I had been on in recent I told her how depressed I had been feeling for years and her one word response that rattles into my head was, you need scripture. 
I knew that the Kovac family was a group of believers, especially Stephen, but I didn't think about it too much afterwards. For the next three months, while well, the Kovacs and I were preparing for our final big dive trip of the year at Cocos Islands, Elaine's words rattled into my head almost three to four times a day, but I still didn't know what to do with them. Fast forward to where we were all together on the Cocos Islands trip, which meant that we were basically on marooned on a research vessel in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During this trip, Elaine's words kept rattling in my head, especially during the actual dives where I feel closest to God in life. Finally, with this angst, it made me build up to the courage on a quiet night on the top of the vessel to ask Stephen for help. Stephen, I said, I'm struggling here. I'm not sure why I'm asking you. You seem like the right guy to ask, but I'm struggling with my belief in Jesus Christ. And your mom told me that I needed to read the scripture. I have never seen Stephen with a bigger smile on his face. He explained to me the gospel passionately, and he understands that my, my brain thinks in accounting terms. And so he said in a very simple way, Jesus died to pay for the debt that I owe of my own sin. Yet I still was very naive and unaware of what really that meant. He told me to come to church with him the following Sunday after the church, after the trip. This is where I was led to Grace Bible Church. And man, I was scared. I felt shame to come here to a house of God, especially a house that Stephen approved of after all of the running wild that I did in the last 10 years. These first few months were eye-opening for me. Stephen and I read the Bible together weekly, and it almost brought me to tears every day. And it particularly, particularly, something that him and I read together on September 15th of 2021. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalms 19, verses 7 through 8. Additionally, Grace Bible Church breaks down the Bible in a way that I have never been able to fully understand in times that I used to attend the Catholic Church. This breaking down or education has helped me be able to read the Bible daily by myself and really be able to connect with God's word. With reading the scripture daily, I started to realize that the Holy Spirit was slowly but surely eradicating sin like I had never seen before. I don't look the same at women. I now don't put my trust in security and money or material goods for that matter. The crack in my soul brought by all of these previous pleasures and luxuries of life is finally being slowly healed and soothing by the warmth of the scripture of God can only provide. I find this verse of scripture that Elaine also gave me once help me explain what's happening to me today. Concerning this, I plead with the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for the powers perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses, insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in, dis in difficulties in the behalf of Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. Second Corinthians verses eight through nine. I realize there is much more to be done eradicating my soul from sin, but I believe I've seen small, young, and simple fruit from my faith in the Lord which has truly made me feel like I have been saved by God. Thank you.
based on your testimony and profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Celeste Olmstead, would you come and tell us what Jesus has done for you? Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is Celeste Olmstead. I was born in California, but I grew up in Orlando, Florida, in a Christian home as an only child. My parents and I attended church fairly regularly, although we weren't often at one particular church for too long. I was taught at an early age that the Bible was the word of God and that I needed Christ as my savior. As a young child, I believed what I had been told about Jesus, and I had a concern for other people to know the truth too. And as I became an older child, however, I was very lonely, and I harbored selfishness and anger in my heart. And these sins of the heart came to the surface more as I entered my teen years, and especially when my parents told me that they were getting divorced. I was 14 at the time, I was naive and sheltered, and I didn't have many friends or confidants. It had never crossed my mind that my parents would divorce because I hadn't noticed any marital issues, and I thought that they believed divorce was wrong in God's eyes. So this news devastated me and essentially turned my world upside down. And I felt very alone as I navigated my remaining years of high school, alternating between living with one parent or the other, and often feeling very lost and unhappy. My heart of anger came out more and more as I had increasing discord with my parents, especially my mother. I attended a church with her, as well as youth group events and Sunday school, and I often had all the correct Bible answers, and I didn't act out in public ways, But in the home, and in my heart and mind, I was stubborn, angry, unsubmissive, judgmental, and I did not honor my parents as the Bible called me to. I got baptized during my early teen years, and I don't recall much about that event now, but as I look back, I think I did this because I believed it was the right thing to do. However, I don't see the evidence of the fruit of true repentance or faith in my life. As I navigated my high school years and tried to escape the difficulties and heartache that continued to consume me, I found an escape by joining an online community where I could make virtual friends around the world and I could create an online identity for myself that was more desirable than the reality of my actual life. I was desperately searching for acceptance and friendship and was not finding that in my real life. And so after numerous months of being addicted to this online community, I met someone who gave me the attention and affection I was craving. He told me he was a Christian, which I believed, but even when it became apparent that he wasn't, I still pursued a relationship with him and began to place him as the object of my affection and desire instead of a pursuit of God, who seemed distant and cold to me. I attempted to sear my conscience against the truth I had been taught from God's word and began to create my own worldview that I thought would better suit my needs and this relationship. I continued down a path of rebellion, which involved lying to my parents about this relationship and eventually deciding to move to another country to live with this person who I had made the center of my universe. I was pursuing my own self-rule And I tried to convince myself that I had the freedom and the right to live however I wanted and that I could leave God as well as the hurts in my past behind in America. But God, in his great mercy, pursued me, even though I was running in the opposite direction of him. Although I was adamantly trying to convince myself that I could be the ruler of my own heart and mind, I kept feeling a guilt over the fact that the path I was taking was in defiance of God's word and in what I had been raised to believe. This conflict in my heart and mind eventually came to a head, and I had a nervous and mental breakdown because I did not know how to deal with the conflicting desires within me. This led me to being hospitalized and then put on some medications to try to remedy what got labeled as a mood disorder. After this ordeal, 
I dealt with many difficult months of feeling disconnected from the world around me. However, God gave me the courage to end the long-distance relationship that I had been in, and as time progressed during my recovery, the only thing that made any sense to me was the thought of going back to church. So I started to attend a church with my dad, and although a lot of the teaching didn't make sense to me because I was still, de still dealing with some mental and medication issues, I did begin to recognize that I needed God in my life and I wanted to know him. I started to see that the breakdown I had experienced was more a result of a spiritual conflict within me rather than a physical issue. One night, I walked the aisle of that church as part of a rededication of my life to Christ, and for the couple years following that, I tried to get involved in numerous young adult church groups. I desired to grow as a Christian, but I really had difficulty finding a church that was biblically and doctrinally sound, so I wasn't being well-fed spiritually, and I also had trouble finding friends who truly love the Lord. So my spiritual growth was very slow during this time, and I made many poor choices as far as the friends and relationships in my life. But in his continued kindness, the Lord brought me a couple years later, so this is while I was in my early 20s, to live in Arizona, which is one of the places I would have least expected to ever move to. I became involved in a church that had better biblical teaching than I had received in Florida, which was a blessing. And then after a few more years, I became part of another church that had a very solid biblical theology and a faithful preaching of his word, as well as a church body that truly exemplified his love. I had never experienced all these elements together or to this degree in a church, and it was the first time as an adult that I had truly felt like a part of a church family. I don't know when I actually became regenerate, but I do know that there was a significant amount of spiritual growth during this time of my life, which I had never experienced to that degree. I began to study my Bible more than I had before, and I saw even more clearly how short I fell of God's requirements. Prior to this, I had acknowledged that I was a sinner and I needed Christ and his substitutionary death on the cross in order to be acceptable to a holy God. But during this time, I learned much more about his absolute holiness, and in light of this, I was confronted even more by my own depravity, and that I truly had nothing to offer him and no way to save myself. <clears throat> These verses from Hebrews 4 became especially significant to me. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I saw that I could not hide any part of my heart from God and that his word is what I truly needed in order to expose my heart and to draw it unto him. The Lord also used my husband, Stephen, who I married during my mid-twenties, to encourage and convict me in my spiritual growth and in trusting the Lord more. He was and continues to be a constant example to me of what faithfully and humbly submitting to, obeying, trusting, and knowing the Lord looks like. I have had to unlearn many misconceptions I had of God, as well as bad doctrine and disconnects that existed between my heart and my mind. The Lord also has used some solid Christian resources, such as the books The Attributes of God by A.W. Pink and Trust in God by Jerry Bridges and sermons from R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, and John Piper to really grow my knowledge and love for Christ as my Savior. In October 2018, the Lord had the good pleasure of bringing Stephen and I and our three children here to Grace Bible Church. There have been so many ways that he has been drawing me closer to himself during my time here. I especially have been impacted at Grace Bible by how much focus is given to God's word and my own personal need to be in his word in a meaningful way each day and in taking a sober and serious consideration of how I am shepherding my heart to Christ, especially as this is evidenced by my obedience and submission to him. I have been consistently confronted with truths from scripture and through the preaching at GBC, as well as the friendships that I've made here to draw closer to Jesus and to submit to him in all aspects of my life. Teachings at GBC have helped me to see and be convicted of many areas where I may assent intellectually to the truth of scripture, but not actually be living out that truth in my heart and mind. When I look at the first half of my life, I see selfishness, pride, and a self-absorption 
that is consistent with the way of the world and the sinful flesh. For the past almost couple of decades, I have wondered if it was necessary to be rebaptized. And as I reflected more and more on my earlier baptism, I do not find convincing evidence that I actually knew Christ as my Savior at the time of that baptism. As I have reviewed scriptures regarding baptism and have witnessed several testimonies and baptisms of members here at GBC, I am convinced and convicted that it would honor Christ to now be baptized as a true, regenerate believer in him and in accordance with his word. I am totally reliant on Christ's death on the cross for the sins I deserve hell for, and I have nothing to offer him except my submission. I now desire to know God and his character more and to trust Jesus with all aspects of my life and with my full heart and mind and to truly be a slave to him. As it says in the book of Romans, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I confess before all of you that I am a wretched sinner who is in need of God's saving grace, and there is nothing I can do to save myself. And so I want to boast in my Savior, Jesus Christ. Based on your testimony and profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, DJ Woodard, come tell us what Christ has done for you. Hello, my name is, can you hear me? (laughs) Hello, my name is DJ Woodard, and I'm here to boast of the Lord's saving work in my life. I grew up in a Christian family, Christian-friendly family. Due to highly differing views of my household, I was only taught the basics of Christianity and baptized before I could remember. Growing up, I did many Christian things, Bible camps, church hopping, youth groups, but at 16, the Lord truly blessed me with the thought, I never picked up my Bible to read it myself. So I did, and I read, and I read, and I read some more, until it was well past breakfast the next day, and I only finished Genesis. (laughs) The only Bible I owned was a King James, so I walked away only getting the gist of a given chapter. That was still more than what I had known growing up. I kept reading straight through for some years, but not for biblical instruction or wisdom, as much as understanding the faith I've been exposed to my whole life. Now, while... While growing up, I was praised for being well-mannered, interested in learning, not violent, not disruptive, not foul-mouthed, could have made better grades, but all around, liked by most and seen as a good kid. These traits continued until I moved away for college, but without proper conviction and discipline, I slowly developed bad habits. Many on-campus ministries and evangelists reached out to me, yet I didn't take the faith seriously. Though I was convinced, convicted, told myself I turned my life around by my own power. That didn't last long. My life consisted of oscillating between sin and conviction, fueled by self-reliance with diminishing returns, through to the time I was nearly 22 and ready to move to Arizona. I was on an upward swing and feeling pretty good about my battle with sin and thought I'd seek out a church. I was contemplating rebaptism, not as an outward show of an inward change to give glory to Christ for salvation, but because I'm in a new place, I'm not struggling with as much sin as I saw, as much sin as I saw a few months prior. I didn't even remember my first baptism. As God planned, the first on-campus evangelist I ran into were members of the Church of Christ, a legalistic church that believes salvation happened at baptism, were seeking a believer to baptize. They had a strict Bible studies. They had a strict Bible studies and believed all other baptisms were null unless you first accepted their teachings. 
as part of their legalistic doctrines, they enforce getting as many Bible books in as possible the first waking hour or two of every morning. Now, there weren't too many books I could read within an hour that fit my cover to cover 10 year Bible plan, only just starting in Isaiah. This meant getting out of my comfort zone and reading a New Testament. Over the course of a month, I read every epistle twice or three times over. Eventually, I started understanding the doctrines of salvation and grace apart from works and realized this doctrine is looking a lot like the Galatians' view and view of circumcision. After a few months, once I studied sufficiently and gathered the courage to bring, up, to bring it up to my discipler, along with a few other concerning issues, I was told that I needed to submit to their authority. So I just promptly left. One part of the... <laughs> One part of their doctrine that stayed with me, however, was the heavy emphasis on sin and the price Jesus paid on the cross. I had never been rebuked in such a way for not taking my sinful habits seriously. The church was unique in the fact that they went as far as to have me put on paper every sin that I could ever think I ever committed. Now, being more alone than ever, without family, without friends, and only with a handful of pages of my sin and conviction, all I could do to cope was not think about it. I ran away to things like bad company, partying, and the like, including immoral relationships. Eventually, the conviction was too much to bear. The sin and self-destruction caused, caused me to take a long, hard look in the mirror and not recognize myself anymore. I was no longer that good kid. I stopped running away and ran towards God's word. I sat down and finished the New Testament, finally taking the time to read the Gospels. In my excitement, I started filling myself up with as much word as I could. I had halted the sinful habits and ended the moral relationship. I was still not quite ready for another church, but I found an online ministry where I was introduced to expository preaching for the first time. And they walked through Proverbs and a study of Psalms. I also ran across John Piper and regularly listened to Ask, pa Ask Pastor John series. I started to feel good and like a good Christian again. And by the grace of our Lord, he continued working in my heart. In the pride of my own heart and self-reliance for overcoming sin, I slowly began to make compromises here and there until before long I had slipped back into the same sinful places, same sinful habits, same sinful relationships. It was then that I doubled down on my self-reliance and stubbornly decided that I would end sin altogether with my own power. And that was the shortest season of all. <laughs> I, saw, I saw my life for the terrible mess I had made it and came to the end of myself. With nothing in my hand but sins and conviction, I cried out to God the Father and Savior Jesus Christ, something to the effect of, forgive me, I want to please you. I only want to please you. I am powerless to stop my, this sin. I'm not that good kid, but only been pretending. Worse than that, I never was even that good kid. And behind all the good habits I had, I knew the sin behind it all. I have nothing to offer and can do nothing but ask for your help. Save me, and, and Christ's sacrifice is my only hope for salvation. And God heard my cries, either this time or the numerous other times over the course of the year I prayed for salvation. Though I didn't see it immediately, God changed my heart to slowly cut out all the sin of my life, and not by the power of power myself, but by the working through his Holy Spirit, he placed me. He placed in me. I no longer desire sin of my former life, nor the friendship of bad company, and the sinful relationship died as a result. I read for the glory of God and sought out a church, not to make me feel good, but now to honor God. God leading to meeting the Beakleys, and who invited me to Grace Bible Church, where I've been exposed to true biblical teaching, which the Lord is using to sanctify me and prepare me for his kingdom. So in faithful obedience and holy joy to testify how the Lord brought me to trust in him alone for salvation, I'm here to be baptized. Based on your testimony, profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
And Diana Allen, come on up and tell us about your Savior. I'm here to be baptized as a testimony of God's grace in my life and as an act of obedience to Jesus' command that believers are to be baptized. For a long time, I had thought I was saved when I was about 16, attending a Seventh-day Adventist school and church where I learned some half-truths. I'd come to know about Jesus. I'd been convicted that I was guilty of breaking God's commandments. I knew Jesus died for the sins of those who believe in him when he died on the cross. I knew this was the way I could go to heaven when I died, and I was taught that to be saved, I must believe in Jesus Christ and become a Seventh-day Adventist. This meant keeping all of the religious requirements of the Adventist Church, all of the requirements of their false prophetess, Ellen G. White, with emphasis on selected Old Testament laws. I'd heard about grace through other influences in my life, but no one could explain what that meant or how it worked or its relationship and context to Old and New Testaments. For me, when choices were laid out, giving up things listed as sin, like eating bacon and going to movies, and adopting conservative Adventist distinctives like not wearing makeup or jewelry and keeping the Sabbath was the price of admission for salvation. So I was taught, and I wanted to be saved. I believed this teaching, and I was baptized. And my life did change. I was zealous. I prayed more. I told others about how to be saved by becoming a Seventh-day Adventist and believing in Jesus. I read verses in the Bible through the interpretive lens of their prophetess. I was ridiculed by my family who didn't like my holier-than-thou choices, which I considered to be persecution. I asked my teachers and church leaders lots of questions and tried really hard to stay sin-free. It sounds like I had checked all the boxes for salvation, doesn't it? I was doing the work. Thinking back, I practiced being a Seventh-day Adventist for about two years. After that, my life was characterized by a variety of peaking and waning efforts towards self-righteous moralism and connecting with God by staying close to some kind of a church. That part has been confusing because some may want to call this my spiritual journey or a falling away. But as I look back, I bore no evidence of a gospel-transformed life. By that, I mean a life changed at the heart level in a way that only the Holy Spirit can accomplish that is consistent with the Bible and growing in Christ-likeness. Believing in the wrong person or work of Jesus saves no one. Counterfeits are slick when they look like the real thing, but they deceive us into thinking we're rich when we're bankrupt. They make us think we're well with God when we're dying without Him. Counterfeits produce external results that don't measure up to Scripture's standard. They're man's attempts to do the work that God sent His Son to do that no man can do. When I was around 40, I had an opportunity to participate in a ladies' Bible study. I jumped into something that was already in progress, probably around Hebrews chapter 5. Opening the Bible, I remember distinctly it seemed like truth I'd never read before was jumping off the pages. So I did the next study, Genesis, and the next. And somewhere in the book of Romans... I remember the conviction of sin overwhelming me and leaving the classroom to fall on my face and pray and call out to God. To try to remember back more than 25 years, I can't answer all that I understood or the timeline of change, but I was steadily learning with my Bible open, 
taking it in and growing in Christ, little by little living more obediently to Scripture, praying, and depending on the Lord. I didn't get grace until I got it. And I don't deserve this. I didn't earn it. I can never pay it back. This gift of faith that happened in an unknown instant gave me new life. And Jesus did it. Everything. It's all him. He chose me. He plucked me out of my solidarity to sin and death. He justified me in his bloody death on the cross when he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. The punishment for all my sin was spent on him, every drop of it, and I will never experience anything but what flows from his love and more love and grace and more grace. It is a gift, and he will not let me go. I'm not who I used to be. I belong to him. He is constant in me. His spirit is changing me more and more into the image of Christ. He is my hope. He is my joy. He is my purpose. He is my life. I love the Lord more than anything. And I also love you. I love his people, the church. I love his word, and I desire to make him known to the lost and walk alongside others who come to know him and together grow in Christ-likeness, fighting sin by the Spirit's power for righteousness in us. According to God's word, he has done this in me. So while I still don't know which day that God's grace plucked me out of my slavery to sin and death, I won't deny that he did. I desire to be baptized today because what I was baptized into as a young adult was a works religion. It was a counterfeit. It was my attempt to save myself, and I can't. And while the act of baptism itself does not save, it is important to God. The Lord made believers' baptism an ordinance I don't want to excuse myself from obedience in this category. By grace, I have been saved through faith. And this is not of myself. It is the gift of God, not of works. I will boast in my Savior. Based on your testimony, clear profession of faith, it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How exhilarating is that? For those of us who know Christ, what it causes in our own hearts is, I can't believe God saved me. When we talk about baptism testimonies, not as a public speaking engagement, but of being in the living room with our friends, with our family, and just talking together about what God has done. And we just got to experience that again. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you have not experienced life transformation There's a room full of people here that would love to tell you what God has done for them. Don't walk away from this opportunity to be right with God. I'm going to pray and then John's going to come up and talk us through church membership today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your grace. We give you praise for the work you have done in in Patrick and Celeste and DJ and Diana. Thank you for the boldness and the clarity with which they have told us and the world all that you've done. God, would you be pleased to encourage all of us who know you to walk with you, 
to open our own mouths and talk about what you've done for us everywhere we go. And would you be pleased even this day to draw people to yourself who are slaves of sin at enmity with you, hostile in mind indeed, people who think that they're good and all right, but who desperately need the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Be pleased to bring them to yourself in faith and repentance today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can see why GBC, as a family, we love these services where we get to hear the testimonies in the water of baptism, and we get to uh, welcome new members. It's kind of a, it's like an ecclesiological extravaganza, you know? We just get to see all these functions of the church happening all in one service. It's incredible. So um, before we end, we're going to ordain a few more people and uh, do some weddings, and just kidding. No, we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> I, I, do, I, I, I do love talking about church membership. We're going we're gonna to welcome some members to GBC as a church family here in a moment. And uh, a typical question that, that comes up uh, about membership is, is, is this really something that's, that's necessary? Is this something that's um, of such you know, primary importance that we would practice it and, and be thrilled about church membership? And, and the answer, of course, is, is absolutely. It's, it's something that's biblical. You can look through your scriptures and you will not find the word membership. Um, it's not a biblical term, but it certainly is a biblical concept. And I just want to say, to make this, hopefully make this clear, how GBC practices church membership has plenty to do with just uh, the application of biblical principles. And there are decisions that uh, the elders have wisely made that might not necessarily be an explicitly biblical issue. For instance, a six-week membership class or a service like this where uh, we would gather together and, and uh, even recite a church covenant together. Uh, these, are, these are great things, uh, but the scriptures don't require that particular application of these principles. But what the scriptures do require is the recognition that to respond to the gospel requires a sinner to separate themselves from a perverse culture and to join themselves to the people of God. And what we see modeled throughout the early church is that the, the church always knew and recognized and took inventory and took incredible care and concern over those who left the world to join the people of God. Um, and it's interesting, in the book of Acts, we see the kind of a, a testimony of, of what the church was doing by way of recognizing who was in the church and who was out of the church. And so if you want to think about some of those texts as maybe the, the biblical um, terms, not if, if, if membership is not used, it certainly is an issue that they know who's in and who's out. Uh, briefly, let me just read to you a section from Acts chapter 2 and, and listen to what the Apostle Peter tells the Jews who are convicted about having just killed Christ. This is his explanation of how they need to respond to the gospel. At the end of the sermon, it's, uh, Luke records in, in Acts 2.37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And listen to this summary. With many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then, here's how they obeyed that exhortation. In verse 41, those who received his words were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. All those who had believed were together and they had many things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number 
day by day, those who were being saved. In case you missed it, it's just fascinating to see how Luke so clearly documents salvation to the Lord being uh, something that's tied inseparably to separation from a perverse culture and joining oneself to the people of God. And so it certainly is a, a biblical reality. In Acts chapter 4, verse 4, the number is up to 5,000. Acts, Acts chapter 5, it says that um, all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So if somebody believed in Christ and they became a Christian, they joined themselves to the church. And then that's the, uh, that's the pattern. That's the model. And that's, that's the reality. I want to just ask one question though, before we, before we call up our new members. And, and that is, as I've thought about this idea of church membership, sometimes we can be helped by saying what we're not saying and what we are saying. What is the scripture saying when it means, uh, when it calls us to join ourselves to Christ and join ourselves to his people? Maybe I could say it this way. What's the glue? What's the glue that makes this community called Grace Bible Church? What is that glue that ties us together in a society that really has made an incredible virtue? It's almost, it's a trendy virtue to highlight community. And, and the world will talk about community. And, um, you know, it's time to kind of steal that term back. What's unique about the community here that's distinct from community in the world? Well, community in the world is uh, what drives social cliques, clubs, circles. Um, and, and even the relationships we might enjoy uh, as parents, sitting and watching our kids play a sport, talking with other parents, watching their kids play a sport, or talking over the, the fence in, a, in the backyard, or a coworker, or whatever circle of influence, we might have some sort of commonality. There might be some sort of shared like or shared interest. But what's the glue that really makes the community of the church the church? The Apostle John's very clear. Our fellowship is with God. Our fellowship is with Christ. And then our fellowship is with one another. And we want our fellowship and our joy to be complete. As Christians, we have fellowship. That means we share and partner in a relationship with the living God. So then by virtue of that vertical fellowship, we have horizontal fellowship because if you have been regenerated, like the four who bear testimony in baptism, if you've been regenerated or given life by God, you have the same spiritual DNA as his other children. And so here we are with this horizontal fellowship that is derived from our unity and our fellowship with God. And then secondly, the second thing I would say is the glue that really binds us together is the fact that the very nature of this community is built on something totally different. And there's memberships and clubs and societies and there's events in, in this world. And if you put everybody at an event at a, a classical music concert, you might say what ties them together is a like of classical music or a romantic interest in somebody who likes classical music. And so there's something, there's some sort of self-absorbed, self-loving glue that ties that event together. And you come to the church, and what's so unique about it is that what ties us together is the desire to see God get glory, and the desire to see others benefited. I mean, you heard Diana just boasting in how, by God's grace, she loves us. I don't deserve that. You don't deserve that. And that's what's so sweet about the church is that um, there's a glue that ties us together because we're interested in God getting glory and there's an interest in seeing our brothers and sisters in this body benefited spiritually. And, and that's so unique from any of the community experienced in the world. And that's what's described in Ephesians chapter 4. Let me just read these first six verses that really describe the unity of the church and this is hopefully helpful for us. Not only our new members who are coming up, but us who are the older members, the member, already members before this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And that is a recipe for unity. That's the glue of the church. Not only relationally preferring others over ourselves and pursuing with all humility uh, what's best for one another, but what ties us together is also doctrinal fidelity. We worship the one Lord, the one God, the one Holy Spirit, and uh, we worship him in truth. Well, at this time, I want to ask our new members to come forward. I'm going to call you up by name. And if you can make your way up, maybe just start right here, kind of in front of the pulpit, and we can kind of spread out uh, in, to both sides. And um, I'll just go ahead, and if you hear, when you hear your name, go ahead and come on up. And you can just turn and face the congregation. Paul and Amy Bearden. Kent and Karina Downer. Alex DeShields. BJ and Ashley Eason. Mark and Ashley Exposito. Stephen and Veronica Gutierrez, Lorena Jimenez, Ray Longoria, Frank and Jennifer Martins, Mike and Vani Perez, Alex and Brianna Robles, Braulio and Lindsay Vasquez. All right. Excellent. This is great. Well, this is exciting because these individuals um, love this church and they're excited to use their gifts here, to, to serve here, to be a part of the gospel ministry here. And I want to ask all of the current members, if you're currently a member of Grace Bible Church, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand where you're at. And we are going to uh, recite the church uh, pact, the church covenant. This is a, a summary of just the biblical instruction and biblical commands of what we need to do and be as members of this church. All right, so if everybody's ready, and hopefully you can uh, re see the, uh, the, the, the text on the back. I think I'm, I think I'm getting older since the last time I did this from, back, from up here. So... Um, if I fade, just go strong, okay? Just <laughs> All right. Humbly trusting that God has graciously brought us to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having been baptized upon our profession of faith, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in dependence upon God's gracious help, solemnly enter into covenant with one another. We will pray and work, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the church, being a peacemaker with all in the church. We will walk together in brotherly love, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, faithfully encouraging, admonishing, and entreating one another as occasion may require seeking with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows, being slow to take offense and quick to forgive and reconcile with one another. We will strive for the advancement of this church for Christ's sake by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, by remaining faithful to God's word concerning our biblical doctrines, church discipline, the Lord's table, and believer's baptism, by exercising the spiritual gifts given to us as members of the body of Christ, by cheerfully, sacrificially to support the gospel ministry of the church as it extends both into this community and the nations. We will seek to live boldly as witnesses for Jesus Christ where God has placed us, living a transformed life and proclaiming the gospel that the mission of Jesus Christ might advance in this world. We will persevere in raising our children under God's watchful care that they might, by His grace, repent and believe in the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ. We will, if we move from this church as soon as possible, unite with another local church where we can obediently live under God's word in fellowship, 
and where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant in the body of Christ. All right. Well, this is exciting. I'm going to um, pray here in just a moment. We're going to close in a final song. And during our final song, I'm going to invite, I'm going to just ask all of you to stay up here for just a moment. The elders want to greet you. And then once uh, elders have greeted everyone, then you can make your way back to your seat. And uh, then we'll have a few closing uh, um, announcements to get us over to our meal. Let me pray. Lord, this is such an exciting time because these dear souls are committed to this church. And Lord, this church is committed to these dear souls. As is always the case in your grace, we, um, Lord, we could never... We can never contribute more than we actually receive by being a part of this church. And I just want to pray for both the new members, that they would serve faithfully, that they would serve with joy, that it would be their greatest privilege to serve here, to use their gifts here, to see the gospel go forward from this place. And I pray for GBC that we as a church would not fail these dear brothers and sisters in Christ that we would be a true church to them, the true body of Christ, that we would be um, loving, that we would be humble, that we would pursue the bond of unity and with peace, and that as a result of our relationships, the truth would be exalted, proven, lived out, that we would all benefit in a pursuit of you, and as a result of our relationship one to another, or as a result of the grace that you give through the body of Christ, we would all be more like your son. Lord, this would be such a, uh, such a sweet privilege. It is a, such a sweet privilege. And, and we're just thrilled that we can even pray that with these dear souls and these faces in mind, knowing you're going to do something beyond what we can ask or imagine through these, through these individuals, uh, through this church. And so we're so thankful for that. So Lord, as we sing this closing song, we pray that you'd be glorified and honored by us as, as your people, as a local assembly of the body of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.